Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Anatomy of a Resume webinar. This is the first episode of our Career Booster webinar series. Um, in this specific webinar, we're going to cover constructing a resume and the necessary items that you will need to go through while constructing your resume. Um, as we go through the webinar, please feel free to chat in any questions. The chat box should be on the right-hand side, and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and go around the room and introduce everyone here. I'm Raylene Jones. And we have Doug Dimler. Hello. Jeremy Bell. Good, up, good, up. Excuse me. good morning. And Karen Sampson. Hi, everyone. So um, let's vary greatly based on the type of job we are pursuing, as well as our own. Sorry, guys. Just a second. We had a slight technical glitch there. Uh, just a moment. Um, I let's, think Raylene had a question. Yes. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, Karen, there are so many resume templates that are available online. Is there a good place where you can find an official resume while you're in this resume process? That's a great question, Raylene, and I'm sure one that many of our listeners uh, have. There's so much out there, and um, it seems like everyone thinks they're an expert, and you know we like to think that as well. But it can be hard for the average person to kind of gauge what's going to be good content and what they should use. And you know the short answer to that question is it really depends. Uh, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, even some of the Microsoft Word templates can get snagged in certain applicant tracking systems. And then in addition to that, the type of resume that's going to be most appropriate for an individual depends a lot on what that individual's goals are with the type of work that they are looking for as well as their past experience. Now, fortunately, our career services coordinators are trained in the standards from the Professional Association of Resume Writers, and they also participate in the National Association of Colleges and Employers. So they have a great perspective on how to evaluate resumes. So fortunately today, you're truly hearing from the experts. Um, so we are going to review five types of resumes, and that will help our listeners to determine which will serve them best. And then we'll walk through the process of creating those resumes. Um, the different types of resumes shown will have a common purpose, and that bottom line goal is really to assist someone in attaining a professional position. And more specifically, the goal of the resume should be to secure an interview. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about um, the different types of resumes. There's uh, there's five that, um, that are pretty common, but the, the one that you'll see the most, the one that's most important to mention is the chrono chronological resume that you see here. Um, so we're going to go over some of those types, but most of the information that will be provided today will be based on this chronological format. Um, so basically, as I mentioned, it's the best one that's going to suit your needs, and it's a traditional style format that's going to provide job uh, or hiring managers with your job history and your education. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the ones we'll talk about are going to vary, but this is the one that you really should base your resume on as it's going to provide the most um, valuable information for potential um, hiring managers and recruiters as you're seeking further education. Yeah. So Jeremy, you've, um, you mentioned that this is um, the one that's going to be the most common. I think you mentioned previously when we were talking that uh, recruiters tend to prefer this one. Do you have any uh, other insights into that? Yeah, and I think with the chronological resume, um, it's really important because it's going to provide your, your most relevant information starting from the most recent and moving back. And as you can see here, you know, what's really good is you want to be able to show them exactly why you're the best person for the job. And moving from top to bottom, you want to start with those career highlights, so you're going to show them, you know, the specific skills and capabilities that you have for that job, highlighting, you know, things as you see here, awards received, you know, my technological proficiencies, you know, my education earned, and then start with that education that's going to be most relevant, you know, your most recent job, and tie that into those those current opportunities. So you're looking at the jobs that you're looking for, you really want to show them on this resume 
how you, you know, not only what experience that you have, but what ties to that opportunity and how you can best um, present yourself for the, the job at hand. Okay, so it sounds like the, the recruiters prefer them because it shows them a really clear record of, of the work that the individual has done in the past. Is what that right? Said. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So the next uh, resume that we're going to look at is the functional resume. Now this is a more non-traditional format. The functional resume is going to be uh, pretty beneficial for those who may have inconsistent job history or maybe you are moving into a different field. So maybe if you've worked in sales or maybe the medical profession and you're, as an example, and you're looking to move into something different, you may not have the actual job experience, but you do have the core competencies that align to those potential opportunities. So a functional resume is good to highlight those, your knowledge, skills, and abilities where the actual employment history may not be as uh, present on the document. Uh, what I will say about the functional resume is, you know, as I mentioned before, the chronological is going to be the one that's most preferred as the functional doesn't really show that employment history. And as we just talked about, employers are really looking to see, you know, the work that you've done up to this point. So, you know, at, you know, it's definitely to your advantage to use a chronological, but if you're in that situation where you may not have that history, but you do have those skills, a functional resume may be more beneficial to you. Um, the next version we're going to look at is the creative resume, and the creative resume is going to be um, very advantageous to those who are going into creative type fields, maybe graphic artists or um, any artistic type positions where your visual um, capabilities are going to be more prevalent. So with this format, it is going to still keep some of those main uh, components of a chronological resume, um, your education, your work history, et cetera, but it's going to have a little bit more visual pizzazz to it. As you can see here, we have all that information, but there's a lot of more striking visuals. You know, here you can see that a resume bar um, for someone, you know, who does do a lot of graphics or, you know, any type of computer design, you do want to show um, just what you're capable of doing. So you want to, you know, strike the visuals, fonts, um, color any pictures that you can provide, this is your opportunity to show that creative element there if you're going for that type of position. Within the public sector, this is going to be pretty uh, valuable for those of you who are going to be looking into maybe a federal or government type position. Um, with a public sector resume, the information that you provide is going to be very specific. Um, to that opportunity. One of the things that you'll notice if you've ever, um, if you're looking for a federal job, a good reference for that is usajobs.gov. And if you go to that website, there is very specific information that they will look for in addition to the job posting. So not only will the uh, job description tell you exactly what they're looking for, but you can build your resume providing that exact information. Uh, the format's going to be pretty similar to the chronological resume, but they will typically ask for more specific information. So not only will you tell the potential employer where you've worked, they may also want to know who your supervisor was, what GS level you were. They may even want to know what your salary was, the hours you worked, and if it's okay to contact your uh, previous employer. Um, so it's really important to understand the job description, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later here, but um, anytime you create a resume, it's really important to understand that position uh, sought and build your resume to meet those specific needs. And you'll see that very prevalently within the public sector because a lot of times if you don't uh, tailor your resume to those opportunities, it's very highly likely that they may not see your uh, resume due to some of the tracking systems or applicant tracking systems that are used. Um, and we can definitely work with you on that um, here in Career Services to tailor a resume specific to your needs in that area. Um, and the next resume here, the Curriculum Vitae, or CV as it's commonly referred to, this is a resume that's going to be uh, used more specifically if you're going into an uh, education position or even a research type position. Um, again, the format does look very familiar, although here there are going to be additional things that you want to include, uh, particularly with your any credentials that you've earned, any uh, continued education that you have publications, anytime you've been publicized in journals or um, industry-specific uh, websites. Um, and you also want to provide uh, detailed information regarding your past training experience. So it's going to be similar 
uh, to a resume, but it's going to be, there's a lot more information that you'll be providing that will be more detailed. Um, something that we do want to note is that with a standard resume, uh, you may hear us say at times that uh, for an entry-level professional, your resume may be about one pages, depending on your experience, or two pages for those of us um, who may have a little bit more professional experience. That being said, the public sector and the curriculum vitae, or CV, will be extensively longer, but your standard resume will be around one to two pages, and we want to generally avoid going any longer than that. Thank you, Jeremy, for reviewing those five types of resumes. Anyone listening, if you need help choosing a specialized resume, you're not sure which type of resume is the best resume for your experience and for the position you're applying for, feel free to contact us at Career Services. Uh, we will help you find the best resume format for the position you're applying for in your previous experience. Um, now that we've sort of reviewed some of those resumes, let's go ahead and dive into the chronological resume um, and the construction process of the chronological resume. But first, um, we're, I'm going to hand it over to Doug. What are some items that uh, applicants and resume writers need to keep in mind while starting the construction? The, the construction process of a resume. Yeah, sure. Let's take some time to review a few things that we should be considered as we create uh, the resume. First and foremost, you want to uh, conduct yourself with absolute integrity. Uh, start with that foundation of who you are and it will serve you throughout your career. If you embellish or exaggerate what is on your resume or your qualifications, uh, you're really not delivering what you're promising. Falsifying employment information may lead to termination and could damage your reputation. Remember, it's not about doctoring up your resume. It's more about capturing the true essence of your actual capabilities and accomplishments. As we proceed throughout this process, we'll suggest to you that you should choose your words carefully and, when possible, match or, and this is important, match your hiring organization's vernacular, meaning make sure that you talk in a way that hiring managers and recruiters can understand, or at least to their own, own way of, of understanding. If you don't understand that, look at the job posting, and that will give you their, uh, the way they word their language. So Doug, it sounds like you're saying that you want to use synonyms, but you're not making things up to fit within that job posting but you're using your experience and putting it in the hiring organization's language. Right, yeah, exactly. You, you just want to be familiar and, and so the hiring managers and recruiters can easily understand um, the way you're conveying your information. Right, thank you. And brevity. One of the most common mistakes um, made when creating a resume is, is the tendency to add too much information. Um, a resume is not intended to include every detail of your professional history. It should be brief and concise. Uh, include plenty of white space. Uh, don't overwhelm the reader with an onslaught of verbiage. Uh, to enhance the white space, a lot of people tend to lengthen the resume, and that's just not something that you should do. As Jeremy mentioned earlier, it should only be one to two pages on a chronological resume. Um, so. If that gets a little hard for you, then uh, please reach out to us and we'll help you with that white space and how it should look. Grammatical perfection. Uh, this is something that we harp on a lot. Uh, there should be no typos, spelling errors. Um, everything should be grammatically perfect. Uh, meaning if you're going to make a mistake on your resume, the hiring manager is going to assume that you're going to make those mistakes as they hire you. Here's a trick that I do. Uh, read through your resume out loud. You'll, you'll be able to understand grammatically as you read it out loud the mistakes that you're making. And we always suggest have many people look at your resume to, to review it. Uh, and that's why we're here. So if you need us, please let us know and we'll definitely look at your your document um, in great detail. Thank you, Doug, for reviewing those key items. Um, we've mentioned a couple times that a resume should only be one to two pages. 
Um, but we have this idea of a master resume. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Karen. Um, she's going to explain, you know, should master resumes also be concise in less than two pages, or can they go over that two-page limit? That's a really good question, Raylene. And this is a tool that we recommend highly to our students because this will allow someone as a job seeker to pull the most relevant information out of this master resume, which we would call kind of the mothership of all things that you've ever done. And when you are <clears throat> searching for empl employment and applying to a lot of different positions, you probably aren't going to want to spend you know, an hour to two hours building a resume from scratch for every single position you apply to. So what the master resume allows you to do is to kind of have that master document that you can glean the most important things from it to build that tailored resume, that customized resume. So we've said multiple times that your resume has to be tailored. You know, it needs to be no more than one to two pages. But this master resume, you know, again, it's the mothership. So this should include everything plus the kitchen sink that you've ever done in your career. Um, everything that you're proud of, and this will be the document that you keep up to date throughout your career. So if you do a really awesome project at work and you're excited about it, write it on here immediately so that you always have that record. And when it is time to look for that new opportunity, you have everything documented and what has been done. Now your goal is just to customize it and tailor it into something that will work for you. Um, before you start customizing a resume, it's important to do some research. On the one hand, you want to equip yourself to understand whether or not this job is even going to be something that will work for you. If you want to work within the culture of that organization, and if you want to work for the people that are there. Just as much as you are interested in that employer knowing about you, you're pre-work starts with you understanding as much about that employer as possible. So look at the job posting, dig into that information, look at the specifics of what they're asking for, and build your resume and your accomplishments to that. But don't stop there. Look at their website, uh, check out any published information they have, news articles that have been written about them if they've been published in professional organization journals. Those types of things can give you some real insight into the culture of that organization, as well as the language that will be most important to them. But the whole key as you are writing that customized resume is to put yourself in the shoes of the recruiter or the hiring manager. And you want to include the points that are going to be the most attractive to them. So you can kind of think of that tailored resume that customized resume as your sales brochure. So it shouldn't list every single thing that you've ever done, but it should be the things that are most relevant to that hiring manager. And don't ever forget that the goal of that document is to help you land an interview. Thank you so much, Karen, for going through your knowledge on customizing a resume and explaining the importance of a master resume. Now that we're all in a proper state of mind, let's dive into the nuts, of, nuts and bolts of a resume. Jeremy, can you explain the chrono chronological resume, please? Sure thing. And let's just start from the very top, and that's going to be your name and contact information. So one of the simplest things that you can do is make sure that your contact information is very easy to read and very easy to follow by a potential reader. So with your name, it should be the most prevalent um, information on the document. So you don't want to go too large with it. I would recommend anywhere from a 14 to 16 point font for your name. And all the rest of the fonts uh, within your document should be around a 12 point font. I wouldn't go any lower than 11 or any bigger than 12. Um, and you want to keep your fonts uh, very simple, very clean. So I'd recommend you know Arial, Times New Roman, something of that nature to keep your resume nice and clean and professional. Um, your contact information should always include your mailing address, your city and state, your phone number, as well as your email address. And I would even go even further if you have a LinkedIn profile, which we recommend everyone have a profile on LinkedIn, include your LinkedIn profile as well. Something to be noted about your address, something that we see occasionally in career services is that the street address 
will occasionally be omit, omitted from the resume. And I recommend to always complete or include your full content information just because while most of our information is shared via the internet, there are some recruiters and hiring managers that are old school and you just might get a job offer via the mail. You, you never know. So you want to give them every opportunity that they can to contact you, whether that's by mail or by email or even on your LinkedIn page. Something else that we want to talk about here is while we're talking about contact information here, um, just going to take a quick poll of everyone in the room. So if you were to get an email from a potential candidate, which one are you most likely to respond to? Billy Beerbongs at lovestoparty.com or William Lumberg at gmail.com? Okay. All right. That and that makes sense just because we want to present the most professional version of ourselves possible when searching for new employment. Um, I know it's fun to have uh, you know fun email addresses and things that represent you, and it's fine to have those. I'm not suggesting that you not have those, but when you're communicating with potential employers or anything of a professional nature, it's more you're going to get more bang for your buck if you go with William Lumberg at gmail.com versus Billy Beerbongs. Just because if I'm a, re a recruiter and someone emails me with that email address, I'm really going to think that that person's not very professional. Um, so I'm probably not going to put invest much time in that person. So go with your first and last name at whatever your email address is. You know, you can't go wrong with that. Something else to consider when using your email address, it's not just a matter of being too personal. There are some times when you can provide information that may present certain biases for you, which we want to avoid. And by I mean by bias is, for example, if I were to, you know, my email address, if it was Jeremy Bell 77 at Grantham.edu, that's really going to tell that person my age. So, you know, we don't want that person to immediately know this is how old I am. This is, you know, this is my faith. This is my political um, affiliation. You want to keep information like that away from your resume. Avoid including any type of personal information on that document that you're going to send out. Something else to consider as well, it's not just your email, but it could also be your voicemail. So your personal voicemail should have to still have a professional tone to them. So I always suggest keeping your voice greetings very simple. This is Jeremy Bell. I'm sorry I missed your call. Please leave your message, et cetera, et cetera. Avoid anything that's too, you know, don't play games on your voicemail. Don't, you know, say anything that you wouldn't say to someone that could potentially give you a job. So keep it professional and you're going to see more results if you were if you were to make jokes or, you know, do anything other than that. Thank you, Jeremy, for going over the contact information. That's a very important part of the resume. Um, now that we've discussed that information, Doug, what can we do, what can an applicant do to really catch the attention of the hiring manager um, on their resume? Well, they should, and I feel very passionate about this one, it, it should be a branding statement. Um, and it's located just below your header um, or your contact information. And it includes uh, an introduction that summarizes what you offer to a prospective employer. We've, ha we've picked out some things that you can call this section, either professional summary, professional overview, summary of qualifications, and key capabilities. The, this is a, a good example of what not to do. Um, what, the, the first thing that jumps out at me is it's, it's an objective statement which refers to what you are seeking. So if we look here, um, to obtain a responsible marketing position, right away it states what you want rather than what you can offer. This is an example of what a professional summary uh, more should look like. Um, you are presenting your skills and how those skills will be beneficial to an organization. If you need any help with this, since it's located towards the top of your resume, um, please let your career services coordinators know and they can assemble a master branding statement that reflects a composite of your knowledge, skills, and abilities. Thank you, Doug, for going over the branding statement. It's very important on your resume because that's the first impression that the hiring, ma hiring manager receives of you. Um, going down to the next section, section in the resume, we've sort of had a conversation about this. What comes first, education or work? And I'm going to turn that over to Karen. What should an 
a resume have listed first, the education or the work experience? Oh, that's, that's a good question and one that we have debated even internally, primarily because it's, it depends so much on the individual's work experience and their goals, kind of coming back to that same thing. Um, you really want to put yourself in the shoes of that hiring manager and determine which of those pieces, which of those elements is going to be most attractive to that potential employer. Most resumes for professional level jobs, so if you've been in the field for a while, you're applying for a promotional opportunity, a management position, kind of that next step up, uh, will lead with work experience. And that's because after a certain point in someone's career, it's kind of the assumption that they will have that education kind of checking off the box, and that's what the recruiter is looking for. And the most important thing to that recruiter will be the work experience. Um, and this can vary. So if the education is going to lead, it would be because um, the individual had kind of limited professional experience or that it was just non-existent. So maybe they come fresh out of high school and, and right into college and they're looking for that very first entry level position. Typically you can tell whether or not the employer is focused on that education piece based on the information that's listed in the job posting. So within the job posting, they may um, make mention of having a certain GPA level or completing a certain number of college credits or having to be a junior or senior uh, within college. So that, those are some cues that you can look for. But again, if you've had a significant background um, working, then that's going to be the most important piece, and that's where it will become more important to tailor those experiences to the role that you're applying to. So um, we'll dive into that just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> like we mentioned before, in most cases, if you're using the chronological resume, you will uh, start with the most recent work experience and then move backwards from there you'll want to list relevant positions, both past and current, including any military service. Um, avoid listing menial jobs unless doing so will fill some gap in your employment history. And when I say menial positions, I mean if you are a business analyst by day and you are working in the evenings um, as a cashier at a gas station, you probably wouldn't list that moonlighting experience on there. Um, but otherwise, nearly any job experience can be made relevant if it's appropriately tailored to the desired position. So, you know, we're going to kind of come back to that idea and that concept of building a sales brochure that's going to help you get your foot in the door. So let's take a look at what that would look like on a resume. So here's a brief example, and we'll build this out, but uh, for each entry, uh, you'll want to include the name of the organization, the dates that you were there, and then a brief, very brief synopsis of some information about that employer. So it should be one to two lines and use descriptors that give the reader some insight into what that organization does. Also, the size of that organization. And that's important because depending on the role that you're applying to, it's a very different type of environment to work for an organization that has about 20 employees versus someone who has 20,000 employees. And so that hiring manager will want to know <clears throat> an idea of the scope of work that's been in your past. So reference the industry, the number of employees, you could include some revenue information if it's a public organization. Um, you'll show the year that you began with that organization and the year that you left. So I want to make note that the months are left off and that is done intentionally. Um, if you've had multiple jobs with the same employer, you would list them all after that employer heading and the total dates of, of service with that organization. Let's build on that just a little bit. Oh, Raymond, did you have a question? I did, Karen. So say a person has a relevant job experience they'd like to list, but it's only five months. Should they list 2014 to 2014 and go ahead and leave the months off in that case? Uh, again, it depends on the context of the entire work history. So let's say 
that is a kind of a blip in somebody's job record. And other than that, they've been at organizations for you know, five years, or, or maybe they were just in that one position at an organization for five months. Um, in that case, I would say it's probably okay to go ahead and list years and leave the, the um, month and date off. Uh, however, if someone, that's their only work experience, that's all that they have to put out there, then I would recommend that they go um, towards the path of a functional resume that can help them highlight more of their skills. And that should get them you know, the desired result. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so kind of going back to this and looking at the job title itself. Um, again, the job title should be prominent. And then right under that title should be a brief synopsis. You can kind of think of it as like a one to three sentence job description that just sums up the general duties and responsibilities for that role. Um, it should be very brief and again tailored to the resume. Um, be sure that if you've had experience that's called for in the job posting that your language or terminology is similar to that found in the posting. So for example, if your master resume uses the phrase enhancing profitability, but the posting uses language that says maximizing margins, those are synonyms. You can swap those two out. You'll see that very commonly in HR positions. They'll use things like HR manager versus HR business partner. Uh, human capital, talent development, there are all kinds of different terms that are out there that mean identically the same thing. So being able to swap that information out um, so that the hiring manager or recruiter can understand what you're talking about will be advantageous for you. And as you continue to build out these entries, the next step is to list your accomplishments. And these should be things that you're proud of and that you could replicate at this new potential employer. So beneath that summary, list things that will reflect favorably on you because this is an opportunity to not only show what you've achieved, but also how you could apply it to the prospective employer. And in addition to that, it will allow the employer to recognize that you are achievement oriented. And that is a huge thing to convey without saying so in uh, your resume. And uh, one thing to note here is that you'll see each of these bullet points is just a single line. Where possible, uh, you want to quantify those accomplishments. Uh, you can see within, within this example here, we have 4%, 2%. You can kind of see how this individual has moved the needle for the organization that they worked for, and that will translate really nicely. But that's not always going to be information you have available and if it's not, you still want to clearly articulate to that particular employer how the organization benefited from the work that you did. So you can see that in the last bullet point here, initiated training for Salesforce to enhance communication to customers. And that gives a results-oriented statement. I want to take just a moment to talk about a military example. Um, so if your work history includes military service, Again, consider your responsibilities and achievements and how they apply to the prospective non-military employer. Uh, some advice that's kind of floating around out there is to not include your rank. However, we recommend that you do because it's just another way that you can demonstrate to that potential employer the level of responsibility that you held. So provide the scope of the role. How many people did you oversee? What size of budget were you responsible for? That type of information will give that recruiter some insight into the work that you did and the level of responsibility you held. Remember that um, you know a lot of branches will use military specific vernacular, and that might be unclear and confusing to civilian recruiters. If your description of your experience has too many of those acronyms or uh, jargon, and this is true not just of military experience, but for anyone. Um, it could have the unintended consequence of causing the reviewer to miss something that's really important about your experience that might have gotten your foot in the door. So be sure to translate terminology into a language that will be clear to your readers. And that should provide you with a good 
an overview of construction of those job descriptions. Jeremy, can you walk us through what education might look like? Sure. And, and we talked about this a little bit earlier as far as where the specific information should line up on your resume. And depending on, you know, what you choose, you know, if you want your education to come at the front of your resume or if you feel it'd be uh, better suited towards the bottom of your resume, it's pretty, uh, it doesn't matter. The format should be very straightforward. Um, and there's specific information that you definitely want to include within your education section, and that's going to be, um, you definitely want the degree that you've earned, and I definitely recommend that you be specific in that degree. As you can see here, we have someone who's earned the Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice from Grantham University, Lenexa, Kansas. So those are the key elements that you want to have in your education section. You want the degree earned, you want the institution where you've attended it, and the location. Um, now, something that uh, another one of the debates that we had um, about this was the year. You'll notice here that the year is missing, whereas in some examples that we've given, the year has been present. So um, one of the things I will recommend, the time that you definitely want to have the year is if you're currently pursuing your degree. So if you are currently working on your bachelor's degree, and let's say you expect to be done by summer of 2017, for that potential hiring manager, it's going to be important for them to know that you know, you're know you working on the degree and you plan to be finished at this specific time. So what I would add in, to, in addition to the information listed here is an anticipated completion date. So you can say anticipated completion June 2017 or expected completion summer 2007. So that's just giving the employer an indication of when you are planning to finish your degree. And that's going to come in handy so if you're applying for a position that's requiring a degree and you're working on it but you're not quite finished, you're still not out of the game. You can still let the employer know that while I've not completed the degree, it is in progress and that can still move you to the next level. Jeremy, I have a question for you. So in the education section, sometimes people include their GPA. Are there any rules or recommendations you have um, on that front? Should the GPA be included? Yeah, definitely. Good question. Um, I recommend um, only including your GPA if it's a 3.5 or higher. Um, it's just it's just one of those standards as far as the um, CPRW, the Certified Resume Writers, because um, really that's it's an academic achievement. Um, it's showing that you're proficient in that um, in your area of study. So if the, you want something that's on the higher end of your GPA, that's not to say that you know. You have a 3.0 that's not as valid, but to, for this document, a 3.5 or higher is going to be better for you. Um, something else to include as far as your education, something else that we've talked about is, you know, we talked about how much information that we want to include on your resume. And something that's common um, is that you definitely don't want to go back too far on your information. Something that we'll talk about is um, your work history. You know, you don't want to go back as far as any further than 10 years on your experience, but with your education, you really don't want to go any further back than your collegiate experience. So to include your high school information, you don't want to do that. So if you're currently um, in college, and I always recommend, like, even if you just started on your associate's degree, and once you've entered higher education, your high school information is no longer relevant on your document. So I would just stick to your collegiate information and move forward from there. Uh, one uh, other thing to mention as far as your education is you definitely want to start with the highest degree earned. So if you have a master's degree, you want to start with your master's degree and work your way back. So you always want to start with your most advanced degree and work your way back from there. Thank you, Jeremy, for going over those education guidelines. Um, we've gone over pretty much the meat of the resume, but we have this other section. Um, Doug, what are some items that an applicant can include in their resume that sort of gives them more leverage professional leverage on their resume? Well, it, let's first um, look at uh, kind of a summary of where we've been so far. We're getting close to the end, and it's really exciting. But um, you know, your contact information, your key capabilities, job histories, um, your most significant accomplishments, your education. Well, what else is there um, to communicate to your prospective employer? If the answer is nothing, then stop there. I mean, there's no need to add things as uh, just because you might think it uh, it might help, but make sure relevancy is the key word here, and we've been saying that all throughout this this webinar. <clears throat> However, if there are information that helps reflect your qualifications for the position or even show that you are a person with 
an interest or an attitude that might serve to make you more attractive and make you more of an attractive candidate, then this is the section where you want to do that. Include, um, information included in this section may, may include professional associations, memberships, other organizations. If uh, you include these, make sure that you, they are relevant to the position you're applying to. Even other things to include is maybe leadership roles, professional uh, certifications, or special interests. Even personal interests, uh, and again, I, I want to stress this only if it pertains to to the position that you're applying to. Things to exclude, uh, unsolicited work product, unsolicited portfolios, and by I mean unsolicited is if the potential employer does not ask for them, don't include that. Other things are photographs and references. Uh, it's just not needed for them. Um, references should be kept on a separate page. Uh, they will ask for them as part of a different process uh, for an employer. Uh, even the phrase references available upon request do not have on a resume. It's just not needed. Thank you, Doug, for explaining that last piece. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. To, to provide you um, with a more comprehensive um, education and resources, we recommend that you do sign up for the career launch. We will send you all of the sign-up information in a follow-up email, along with more information on our future webinars that we will have. Um, available to you. We're, at this time, we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. Jeremy, why don't you go ahead and read some of those chat questions we got. Thanks, Raylene. Um, and the first question we had is from David Parker. Do you recommend anything special for a job that is no longer in business? Um, I would definitely say my opinion on that is even if the business is out, if they're no longer in business, you still want to include that on your resume. I wouldn't omit that if the company is no longer there. Um, I would be prepared to speak to that if you get to the point where you are called in for an interview and there maybe is a background or reference check. Um, I would make it known that you did work there, provide the information, but make it known that that company is no longer in service. Yeah, you may also prep yourself with a reference from that organization. You know, if you know anyone who's still in your professional network that you can reach out to that can kind of provide you with that, you know, vouch for you to say, yes, you really worked there. Um, but most times even, you know, your tax history, your background check, all of that, it should still be verifiable. But that experience is important, so I would say include it. Yeah. All right, um, so Robert asks, I currently hold an Associates in Business Management, but I'm working on my bachelor's in the same field. When completed, should I put both on the same resume or just the highest one achieved? I would say just the highest one achieved. If they're the same degree, it's basically the Associates, you're, it's the first half of the bachelor's. So once you've completed it, I, now I would say to include both. While you're currently working on the business management degree, you can still list your associates as a completed degree because you do have an associates and you could have your bachelor's listed as to be anticipated or completed at a specific time. But once that highest degree is earned, you can I would recommend just listing the, the bachelor's degree. So if the associates is in a different field or a different degree, have them both listed. Correct. But if they're the same, go ahead and consolidate once you've earned the higher degree. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, next question from Curtis. Um, does the resume have to have the same look as the one on the screen chronological or can the uh, or can be different but still in the same order? Uh, I think if we're talking a little bit about formatting, um, that might be something to, to touch on real briefly. We talked a little bit throughout and mentioned the term ATS or applicant tracking system. Um, one of the things to be conscientious of as a job seeker is that many larger employers have software that can screen resumes for them. And so we keep the formatting pretty simple because a lot of tables or you know, certain types of font will trip up that software and cause your resume to never get to that recruiter's eyes. So that's kind of where, where we go with that. Now, it's always up to your discretion, depending on the rule, if you want to add some additional you know, formatting or color or that sort of thing, um, particularly as in the example of that creative resume. But I'm sure Jeremy or Doug might have some additional insight on that. As far as the format? 
Um, I think it would, I would keep it pretty straightforward. Um, the chronological is definitely the best way to go um, for any resume. Now, your how you design or how you know what you you know how you feel comfortable with the resume on paper. You know, it's I think there's definitely a difference between the resume that you hand in. You know, you give some literally hand to someone versus the resume that you submit online. I think the resume that you submit online, as Karen mentioned with APS, that's when you want to be really conscientious of exactly how you format the bullets and things like that because it is going to make the difference between it getting to the right person. Whereas if you hand the, de the resume to someone, you can be a little bit more creative. Okay. Yeah, I, I think with that is, uh, you know, keep it simple. And, and we had talked about where you place education and if you have any questions, let us know. As far as uh, applicant tracking systems, not all applicant tracking systems are alike. So in other words, one company might purchase one software for an applicant tracking system and another company might purchase another software system uh, for an applicant tracking system. And, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a large company or a small company because even a large company who you would think would have a lot of resources would would get the latest and greatest of applicant tracking systems, but that's not even the case. It, it just depends. Uh, my rule of thumb is is you never know what an employer will will have and whether they do have an applicant tracking system or do not. So go by the rule of thumb is they do, and make sure your your resume is free of all that. And again, we're experts here on applicant tracking systems. Um, as much as we can be because again no applicant tracking system is the same but we do have a lot of the key points that of not to include so make sure you, your resume gets to the applicant tracking system to an actual human being right mm -hmm. yeah and the only other thing I would add to that is just you know we t talked about it before um, with tailoring your resume and I think another key point of that it's not so much the format you know that you choose for your resume it's really the content of your resume because as we talked about before you know, as Karen mentioned, doing your research, understanding, you know, just the specifics of the job in, entails. So, you know, pay attention to the qualifications, pay attention to the attributes, pay attention to the expectations, and as much of that specific language that you can tie into your to your resume, that's going to make a huge difference because just like with the public sector and USA Jobs, as I mentioned before, there's very specific information that they're going to look for. Um, so the more that you can speak their language and you know speak to those opportunities directly, it's going to make getting to getting through those various systems a lot easier. Because as Doug mentioned, not every tracking system is the same. We've even learned that some you know some HR you know professionals have admitted just how not a group how inaccurate their act tracking systems tend to be. So you can never be too sure on what information is coming across. So as accurate as you can be, the better. Yeah, I'm going to make another point on that. Sorry, this is, a, this is a good topic. Yeah. Um, but those systems are looking for keywords, and the keywords are entered by the recruiters. And sometimes those recruiters don't work in the same field. So if you're applying for a role in uh, computer science or in technology or in the medical field, that recruiter may or may not have a lot of industry knowledge. So whether it's the ATS that's, that's scanning through the resumes or the recruiter, the more that your language matches, that's how the recruiter and the ATS are going to align those keywords to get your resume to the hiring manager. Yeah, I think, I think when you're talking about keywords, uh, that's exactly what uh, an applicant tracking system does. First it looks for keywords, then it looks for um, spelling and grammatical errors. If you have those on there, it will immediately uh, reject your resume. So th those two things are are very big to look at. Um, and if you don't know what the keywords are, consult your career coordinator um, or look at the job posting. They'll they'll have keywords in the job posting. Uh, as Karen said, the recruiter will actually put those keywords in the job posting. But if not, if they're hard to understand when you're looking at that, please consult us. We can help you out with that. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Good stuff. Um, so Eric asked, how about listing graduating with honors, same as GPA? Another a good question. Um, and, you know, just as mentioned with, you know, while I mentioned before that, you know, you want to list a GPA that's 3.5 or higher. If you graduated with honors, definitely mention that on your resume. You know, if it's cum laude, summa cum laude, you know, master's degree with distinction, I would definitely recommend listing that on your resume. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that too. Yeah. 
Um, any, any, I think the key is any accolades or awards of distinction, and that could even include with your job, as Karen mentioned, with you know those accomplishments or those bullet points in your job description. Any commendations, you know, you've received the employee of the month or any recognition, maybe not employee of the month, but you know what I mean. So any recognition from your company is good. Uh, how do I, uh, Ellen asks, how do I construct a resume if I have no work experience related to the field I went to school for? Great question. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start on that, but okay. I'm sure most people will have <laughs> yeah. comments about this. But um, Ellen, I would you know, take a look at the experience that you've had in the past. Likely there are some things about those, that work experience that does apply to the roles that you're applying to. In almost every job, there are some elements of project management that you can pull out. Um, there are definitely elements of time management or customer service. Um, some leadership things. And you may have to think through it a bit, but you want to look for those elements and draw them out where they may fit within that uh, prospective role. In addition to that, in that scenario, you may want to lead with your education. Um, that would be that type of example. Lead with that education and then tailor the, the work history to the position that you're applying for. I'm sure these guys will have some additional input on that. Oh yeah, I, mean, I would totally agree with that. I think the key is just pull. It, I would agree. It's just finding out, you know, how well you best fit that opportunity. And the more you understand the job itself, you know, and the more you can relate it to your experience, you know, I think the functional, um, the functional resume. This is kind of where that comes in. Where you know, if you need to put as much focus on your your skills and capabilities, that. Could, that could be your your advantage, you know. If, even if you don't have the work history, you could speak to and provide, you know, proof of that. I think, and the proof could come with how you put it in your job descriptions or where that comes from. I think that will help you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I, I think you you have a conversation with somebody or yourself and and think about some of those key things that you've done and that you can pull out. Again, we're not trying to to make any false statements here, but we are trying to, to have you look uh, at certain things that you've done um, within those jobs that don't relate to what you're applying to. And you can really pull out a lot of things if you have that conversation with yourself. And, and, and again, we can help you with that too, with, with having those conversations of what did you do, how did you, when you say this, to how did that, do you mean this? And then we can pull that information out and relate that to the job you're applying for. And of course, as I stressed earlier, the branding statement, which is a great way for you to, to really have those skills, especially if you're going to school here, which you'll, you're going to have those educational skills. But you've done projects and certain things in, within your education that we can pull out and pull in that branding statement that would relate to the job you're applying to. Right. That's a great point. Yeah, and sometimes it's as simple, you know, going back to that research piece is, I think Ray Lee and I did, this the other day was where you look at the job itself or even look at the type of position that you're looking to go into. So let's say, you know, you may be working in sales right now, but you're looking to go into project management. I think you may not even have a specific position that you're applying for, but as long as you can understand the components of that potential career, so break it down. So what are the core competencies? And we can, you know, definitely go over, you know, what that means, but just think of what are the core competencies that are areas of expertise for someone who's success, successful in this type of role. And then, you know, think of those words. So if it's organization, if it's effective communication, if it's multitasking, what have you, look at your resume as it stands and maybe go through it and say, okay, where have I done these specific things? Because sometimes it's right there in front of you. And if you can look at that and even just circle, like, yep, there it is here, there it is there. And so you can see, you may not think you have the relevant experience, but if you dig deep enough into your resume, as, even as it is now, you may find those skills. It's just a matter of, of really understanding what your target is and how you may have already met that. So having an understanding of that, that is really uh, key, but we can definitely work through those on a case by case. Uh, so moving on, so Dorinda asks, how do I list my job experience that is older than five years but is relevant to what you are trying to get into now? Is that a good question? Um, and I think definitely, you know, as we talked about, if that, inf let's say if your information is your job history goes back further than that, you can definitely promote that. You know, you could have a, a section for relevant job history. Um, 
and promote that towards the top of your resume so they can see that you know this is the work that I've done even if it has been a little while since I've done it and then have you know follow that with an additional work uh, history section that could cover maybe the job that you're in now or any other significant pieces so you know again we don't I don't think personally you want to go back too far unless it's relevant so if you're working in a specific industry now even going back to saying okay, okay, I want to get into project management, maybe I had in a few years, but I want to get back into it, but I want to show them that I have had it, promote that at the front, and then use anything else towards the, towards the end. I think that's a good point. And, and, you know, again, kind of going back to the concept of the brochure, if somebody is going to see the top and the first page first, so you want your most important information there, the thing that the uh, recruiter is going to find most valuable. I think just my opinion on that is if you have experience in the field but it's more than 10 years old, you still have that experience. That would be the key words and certifications that you can add into your branding statement that qualify you for the position that you're applying for and make you look good and qualified to the hiring manager who's, who's looking through your resume. That's a really good point. A lot of times in the branding statement you might list you know, project manager with 25 years of experience, and that could be one of those statements that you pull in. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. We, of course, we may not get to all of these, but I'm going to keep going until we run out of time here. Um, so this one uh, from Barry. I'm currently working on my uh, Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. This is actually my second bachelor's degree. I earned a BA in 1987 which yielded no professional career. I also have no work experience related to the degree I'm working on. Should I leave out my degree from 1987? And then the second question is, should I use a chronological or functional resume? Good question. Doug, do you want to take this as our engineering computer science guy? Well, I definitely look at uh, the functional resume um, and, and don't rule out the chronological resume. Um, and what was what was his degree in 1987? Did he list what it, what that was? Uh, it just says uh, BA in '87. Okay. If it's relevant to what you're looking for now, list it. If not, don't, um, because you're currently going through your degree program, uh, and I'm assuming of what you want um, to look to look for in a job. So I would say not listing that. I think Karen shook her head. Maybe yes, but she'll explain that here in, in a minute. But if it doesn't relate to uh, your the job that you're hoping to get uh, when you graduate, or even now, um, I would not list it uh, personally. Yeah, I'm going to take the uh, uh, counter approach there because um, one of the things, Barry, um, that we're kind of thinking about is, is that that you have a bachelor's degree. And sometimes the job posting will just require that you have a bachelor's degree. And it may not necessarily um, matter what field that, that is that is in. It may just be a requirement of the job. So I would advocate for listing it. But I would say do not put the date on that um, because, and you know, we talked about this a little bit before, but that date can give uh, an indication of your age in some situations, and that could present a bias for that hiring manager. So I would say don't list the date, but list the degree and uh, and that then was, also the one, the current one that you're working on with an anticipated date. That was my next thought when I handed it to Karen was if you know you just leave off the date if you've already completed your your bachelor's in 1987, it doesn't really matter as long as you've completed your bachelor's, just leave off the 1987 on it. All right. All right. So the next question from Ellen, um, I have a BA in criminal justice and I also have an associate degree in graphic design. Should I put my degree in graphic design even though my focus is in the public sector? And I think, you know, again, it's, it's kind of the same thing where, you know, you don't want to omit any education that you have. I think any of that education is going to be relevant. So, you know, I would, again, list both just as Karen mentioned before. Besides your high school experience, don't include your high school experience. Oh, yeah. You have so, college experience. Correct. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, so the high school, at this, at this point, pretty much the high school is a given. Yeah. So. All right. We're going to do one more. Uh, I retired in July. This is...
be pursuing, but you want to start that process so there's no surprises. You know, and that also includes networking. You know, you definitely want to start networking and asking questions from people. Um, so yeah, I would definitely uh, start that uh, as soon as possible. Um, are there, uh, let's see, let's I go. think we may uh, continue with a uh, question so that we can get to everybody, but for those of you who may be short on time, you're welcome to drop off and we will um, include the recording of the rest of the questions within our follow-up email, so you should be able to access that and listen to those if we haven't gotten to yours yet, but we'll continue to go through and answer the rest of these questions. All right, um, so the next one from, uh, Rebecca asked, I know, let's see, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to, um, I know this may seem silly, but much like Elle Woods did in Legally Blonde, she was submitting her resume in a very straight-laced law firm, but she added her own creativity and gave them a taste of what she is as a person. Would you say that is something that can put you over the top, or would you say that's not something that's really important when applying for a basic job, i.e. universities and corporations? Very good question, Rebecca. Rebecca, I have a couple initial thoughts on that. So, you know, you're welcome to put your personal flair on it that you're gambling. You know, it's a risk that you're taking to, you know, I mean, maybe that potential employer, is that's going to be something that they value, maybe not. I mean, it's a total, uh, you know, gamble on what they're looking for. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, depending on how you look at it, this is one of those times where I would recommend that you play it safe because um, you can have that opportunity, get your foot in the door, and then you're more than welcome to express yourself at that point. But much like dressing for the job interview, you know, a lot of people that we talk to want to have that own personal touch and they want to have a little creativity, a little color out there, you know, where they're dangly earrings, whatever it might be. Um, but Again, it's a gamble, and you never know who's going to be sitting across from that table or reviewing your resume, so it's a good rule of thumb to play it safe. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy as, as far as the way you dress to the way you should have your, your resume. Um, and also, back with that movie, it was probably before African tracking systems, so um, <laughs> we should probably you know throw that into the mix now and, uh, uh, again, let, let your resume do the talking rather than um, the flair of the resume. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's with the exception being, if you're looking for a role in a marketing firm or a creative type of position, right. you know, that is probably the exception. Well, and even in the creative slash marketing field, if you're getting into that and you're applying online, I would submit the bland version on the online um, site because that has the potential of going through an applicant tracking system and then bring in your pretty resume into the interview for that creative position because applicant tracking systems, they can't read boxes, they're symbols that they can't read, and that can, you know, improperly reading your resume, that can get you kicked out before you even have a chance to speak with a hiring manager. So if you are in that creative position, applying for a creative position, you can bring in materials that are printed the way you like that can help you present yourself creatively for that position. Or you can mail them, you know. That's, yeah. I know that. It's old school, but, it's old school, but, but you use the snail mail. Yeah. <clears throat> and it goes a lot faster than it used to. It does, yeah. All right. So Narissa asks, is it better to upload a resume or complete the one that they have on the website? Good question. Um, my, uh, my answer to that is to do both. I think uh, a lot of times when you on those websites, they will add, you do have the option to submit your resume, but they will also ask you to complete out complete the application. So I always recommend doing both because when it's got to follow those instructions, and um, they may need the information in more than one format. So, but I definitely recommend. And that. you know, there's a difference between the resume you upload and the application that they walk you through. So the application is a detailed history, whereas your resume, again, is your sales brochure, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, I, I just talked to two recruiters that work at two different companies, and they say it's very important that you fill out the information, the online information, and you send your, or, and you submit your resume. The reason for that is they pull information from uh, what you answer in the online application, and some 
some of if you submit your resume, they might pull information from there, but make sure you complete the information. It's always it's always good to complete the information that they have because that's their process. And then the resume, when they ask for you to submit your resume, you need to do that too. And that's coming from the, the recruiters that I just talked to yesterday. It was good information. Um, so really, I know it takes a lot of time, and, it, and sometimes it may take 30 minutes to an hour or more to do all of these things uh, for one company, but it's really uh, beneficial to you. Well, and I think also uploading the document along with answering the fields or the boxes in the application, when you upload the document, that gives the hiring manager a nice little package that they can open and print off to prepare for the interview. And that's really important because you want to make the hiring job, hiring manager's job as easy as you can because that makes you look favorable in their eyes. Absolutely. Good point. The only other thing I would add that, um, with uploading your document on some of those application sites is to definitely, again, be careful of your formatting because sometimes that information or even the layout that you have on your document can sometimes get um, reformat or even distorted a little bit once it's gone through their system. So maybe, again, you know, we talked a lot about Flare and using those different things. If you know you're going to be uploading it directly to that website, you may want to simplify it even more just for that and just in case um, it may get distorted or yeah. even reformatted. For that reason also, I recommend uh, using a PDF file or transferring your Word document to a PDF and that keeps your formatting intact through that system. All right, uh, next question from Sean. Um, or no, actually this one from Robert. Is it okay to have breaks in the dates? Um, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely okay to have breaks in the dates um, or as we refer to gaps um, in your employment, I guess you would say. And I think it, that's fine. Um, if you, I think I would definitely just say if you have those breaks, if you can't fill them with maybe some other information, like maybe you had a part-time job or you did some other work, you definitely want to be able to speak to those in the interview. So if you have any period of time for which you weren't working, I would just suggest to be able to, you know, if the employer asks you about it, be prepared to speak to it. Yeah, and you can also fill in with volunteer experiences. If that was a period of time where you were going to school but you weren't working, those might be things to include. If it's too spotty and too inconsistent, then you may want to opt for a functional resume. Um, and that kind of lets your competency speak rather than um, your gap. I think another thing, um, an additional what Karen just said is if there's a lot of gaps or if there's, it's just confusing for the hiring manager to see the, you know, to understand the gaps, then you might want to include a cover letter. Uh, the only reason why you wouldn't want to include that cover letter when there is gaps is when they say, please, no cover letters. But generally, uh, you don't see that too often now, but you, they just don't ask for them. But a great way to explain your gaps is a cover letter. Also, you might want to look into a functional resume, which is for a more unconventional work history. That could also be an option for you. Good thought. All right, so uh, Sean asks, referencing grammatical perfection when using bullet points, I noticed that you left off periods at the end of each statement. Should I follow suit? Yes. Um, the, the bullet point is not a full sentence. Um, and even in our example where we start listing out the um, brief description under the organization or under the um, job title, none of those are complete sentences. Your goal here is to keep things brief. So you want short, quick statements that are easy to read for that hiring manager. Um, I think Raylene has a... I do. I have something that I don't think we mentioned mm -hmm. as a tip. Do not use personal pronouns in your descriptions, in your branding statement, in your job descriptions. You don't want to say, I did this. The hiring manager knows that you did it because it's your resume. Say, start with a verb or an action verb that says maintain, manage, administrate, you know, you don't have to write I, me, my every time because that's, you know, it's your resume. Of course, it was you that did that. Good yeah, very good. All right. Uh, and Corey asks, so if you have been at one company 15 years, don't list anything before that? Um, I think if you, if you, honestly, I think that's a special case. If you have been with the same company for that amount of time, you definitely want to list that. Um, I think if it's, if it's been one position. You know, if it's been if you've held the same position for a considerable amount of time, 
then you know I definitely would want to list you know all that relevant history. But I think if you have multiple jobs with the same company that happen to go back 15 years, you may want to uh, look a little bit more carefully at that experience to think, okay, what falls beyond that threshold that, that I may want to omit from that document. Well, yeah, and in generally in those cases when you've been with a company for 15 years, you're moving up in the ranks. So those higher, you know, those higher qualified positions like manager are going to be more important than, you know, your entry level position when you first started with the company. And, and let's say it's one position. Um, what I would do is, again, we, we talked about with experience that's not relevant to the job you're applying for, have that conversation with yourself or with us to pull out those key words that you might have done that you just didn't put on your resume. Um, with the 20 years experience with one company, I can almost guarantee you that we can pull those that information out out that would relate to the job you're applying for. Yeah, you may also think in terms of special projects or committees that you've worked on. Um, those types of things can add to add some dimension to that single um, job position. And certainly, you could list out key accomplishments associated with those types of additional roles that you've played. Awesome. Uh, Greg, you had asked, uh, what are some tips you can give for federal resumes? Mm -hmm. um, Good, very good question, um, and this is definitely one, you know, as we mentioned uh, before, federal resumes are a little bit different uh, beast than your typical resume that you would send to most corporations, where and I always, when I think of federal resumes or even federal positions, what I like about those jobs is that they're going to tell you exactly what they're looking for, what specific qualifications that they have, and, you know, really what it takes to move through the application process. Um, but with that, there are some specific things that should be included on that document. As we mentioned before with the public sector documents, um, there are going to be additional pieces that you'll want to add. You know, for each specific job you've held, they're going to want to know some of those, not only just the descriptions themselves, but they're going to want to know what specific knowledge, skills, and abilities have you performed within that job that are going to apply to that open position. So if they're looking for someone, let's say they have a federal HR position or even a federal technical position, what have you, they're going to have specific knowledge, skills, and abilities that are going to be required for that job. So you want to be prepared to speak to those in those jobs because as you mentioned before, we've talked a lot about applicant tracking systems. Federal, most federal jobs are going to have a specific indicator they're looking for uh, which would be the best qualified candidate. Um, and for those who meet that, those are going to be the ones that are going to make it to the next step in the application process. So as much as you can meet that uh, beforehand, so when you go to those sites, really read the positions. There's also an occupational questionnaire um, that will typically be included that you want to be able to answer those specific questions. So it's not, you know, it's not like most corporate jobs or even professional jobs where, you know, you send, um, your resume in, to the best of your knowledge, they want specific information. Um, but uh, in addition to that, you know, there's just some other mechanical things um, that uh, they're going to ask for. So, you know, they don't want to, they won't want to know just where you worked and how long you worked there. They want to know who your supervisor is. They want to, they may want to know how, what your salary was. They may want to know, you know, if it's all right if they contact that supervisor directly. And we have uh, specific formats and information um, that we can provide for you um, to create your federal resume. Any of us can definitely work with you to create that. And, um, and that is definitely something that we're going to tackle, you know, moving forward within this series is federal um, employment applications. We have done one in the past on the application process, um, and we are going to be doing more of that. But at any time, you can definitely contact us, and we can work with you to create a, um, a uh, specific federal resume moving forward. Um, let's see. We have a few more here. So uh, Andrew asked, what if there is a company they can't call due to a settlement, but they can email only? Um, I think that's not information that you would include on the resume, but in um, once that employer has determined that they want to bring you on board, if they ask for references, that might be the point that you share that information with the employer. Uh, it's definitely, I would not list it on that uh, resume or on the application unless it's specifically asked for. Cross that bridge when you get to it. 
Right. Uh, and Lindsay asked, when doing an education section, should you specify how you earned your degree, as in online or on campus? Um, and I, my straightforward answer to that is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't indicate either or. I think, you know, regardless of the format, um, and we're just in an environment now where online is so common now, regardless of the university, that that's really not uh, an important point. So if you've got a degree from Grantham University, really all they need to know is, the university, the location, and um, what degree you actually earned, but I wouldn't uh, worry about putting whether it was online or not. Yeah, most, I mean, it's just not uh, not commonplace to see that listed on a resume, and yeah, it, it's kind of irrelevant because you've earned a degree. Right. That's the important part. Yeah. Well, and sort of what Karen covered earlier is that the um, the education section in the, a lot of situations is sort of a checkbox for the hiring manager in that um, they want to look through to see if you're qualified for the position and then, oh, do they have an education? Yes, check. They're, they can work in this position. So just keep that in mind. Right. All right. Um, and Corey asked, where do you suggest placing the military job listing if you are currently serving in an active reserve capacity? Um, and I think you're, you know, regardless of if it's military or civilian, I think you're going to list your information in the same format. Um, I think your your information may be a little bit different, um, but I think it's not going to vary um, whether your uh, whether your current status in the military. You're still going to want to format um, your resume in the same manner as if you were any other way. Yeah. The only thing that I'm wondering if you're kind of trying to get at is if you have a current full time job and you're also serving in a reserve capacity. In which case, I would list your current full-time job first, and then list the reserve um, or guard duty second. But do you guys have any other comments on that? I I think that that's a good way to look at it. Um, I think if it's relevant experience that you you have in in the military that you're currently doing, it, I don't I don't know if it matters if you list it first or not. But um, if it's not relevant and you do have another job, then of course. You know, list your other job and try to pull up those those keywords there. But I, I don't I don't see it being any different, um, especially if it relates to the job you're applying to. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. So a uh, couple other quick questions here. Um, will the presentation be available for attendees? Yes. Um, and then uh, Andrew asked, would certifications go under education? And um, I think yeah. Um, I think there's a a way that you can do that. One way, if you wanted to have one section for education, you could list your specific degrees. If you have certifications or even multiple certifications, you may list um, continued education and list those um, or any additional education or relevant um, certifications that you have. That would be fine. Yeah, um, sometimes people will list, it, list that section as certification or education and education, certification yeah. and combine the two. Um, or you can have a separate section. Again, it kind of depends on the amount of white space you have and how you're flushing in your resume otherwise. But yeah, I've seen this on a um, on several resumes where people with past military experience have their military training, which is a type of education. Um, I normally recommend that they put it in a separate section. And again, it's imperative that you only include the trainings and education that is relevant to the position you're going into. So say you have military training in terrorism, but you're going into a field that that's not even a, a consideration in, you wouldn't necessarily need to list that training. But if you have military training in um, human resources and you're going for a human resources position, of course you want to put that on there because that gives you professional leverage for the position. Great point. All right. So just uh, would it be okay to include any volunteer work? Um, and my answer to that would be yes. Again, like as, as Raylene said, if it's relevant. Um, but I wouldn't. Uh, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's. It's worth mentioning on there. You know. Yeah. But I think it's valid if it depend. You know, it depends. Like on if it's relevant to that position, include it. If it's not, then don't. Um, kind of going back to like. I work in HR. I also volunteer on a city human relations commission. That's pretty relevant to the type of work that I do, so I might include that. Now, if I volunteered um, at my child's school and it wasn't relevant to the type of work that I was doing, 
I wouldn't include it. But if I were going into a position <clears throat> where I was going to be working with children, I might include that experience. So kind of depends again. Yeah, and something else, and thinking about that, you know, you may also want to consider, consider what volunteer work that you did that's that could be tied to the work that you already do. I know, you know, for us, for example, you know, we've provided uh, the same services that we've done outside of the institution. So, you know, we've worked with veterans, we've worked with, you know, folks with goodwill, goodwill the goodwill industries. Um, so it's, you know, it's bond, it, technically it's volunteer work, but we're doing the same thing. So if you consider something like that, maybe there's work that you do that you've provided, you know, on your own time or, you know, just as an outreach or goodwill effort, that's definitely something to consider as well. A follow-up question for that. If the volunteer experience is more than 10 years old, should they include it on the resume? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Same rules apply. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last question uh, from uh, Kenneth. You mentioned not to have any references. I always have heard it's good to have references or even a letter of recommendation. Um, and I think you are right. I think it is good to have those. Um, I think Doug may have mentioned this earlier is that with the, um, and just to restate this, you know, we see a lot of times on resumes, we'll see that one famous section at the end where references will be available upon request. And really, that's kind of a given. So, you know, in any application or any job process, the usually that there's one stage in the process after you've gone through the interview is they're going to check your references. Um, so while, so we don't feel it's necessary to have on your resume, but you should have a list of, re of your references readily available along with letters of recommendation. The only the other thing I would add to that is whoever you choose as your references, choose them wisely, you know, and that's, uh, that could be the case for both your personal and your professional references or anyone that you're going to get letters of recommendation from. So you want to make sure that these are people that, you know, know your, they know your history well and can speak to it well. Um, they're not, you know, they, they're not going to be in a position where they're making stuff up or even they're caught off guard. Yeah. Oh. Your references should always be made aware in advance that uh, someone might be reaching out to you and um, be cognizant of who you choose and how they will reflect upon you. And one way for you to ask the question is to say, hey, Doug, would you be willing to provide me with a positive professional recommendation? And you want to phrase it that way because you want to be sure as that candidate that that person, you don't want to make assumptions about that. They're going to provide you with a positive and professional re uh, reference and also that they will come across to that recruiter in a professional manner as well. So make sure it's not the friend who has the trick voicemail or the weird uh, ring back tones that they have a professional setup as well. Right. I do have a comment on that. So many times when you're applying, the, the job application process has that space for your references. So I mean, always bring your references with you in paper form in the interview, but they probably already have that information through the application process. And something, a little trick that I do, you know, when you're applying for a new position and you have your list of references, they've okayed that they will be a reference for you, you can go ahead and send them your updated resume just for them to reference to know, you know, what you've been doing in this, you know, past year or so since since you've been personally in contact with them. That's a great That's point. That's a really good point. Yeah. You know, piggyback, oh, I'm sorry. Go no, I, no, go ahead. I was gonna I was gonna say the resume, you know, the resume and having an idea of their work history is a good point because, you know, I can even think of a, a of experiences where I've worked with someone, you know, I've had a, you know, a really good, strong relationship with them, but that job could have been in 2008 or 2007. I don't, I may not know much about their work history since we worked together, and if I don't know what they've done between 2008 and 2017, that may put me at a disadvantage if that recruiter were to call me and ask me about that work. So I think that's a good, that's what I was going to say. It's a good point to have that information ready. Yeah, I was going to piggyback off that. So let's say you're, you know, you know, you've gone from one job to another, and years have gone by, um, and you're using the same references. Always get back to those people and say, "Hey, I'm on the job hunt again. Um, can I use you as a reference?" Um, and the reason why, when I first started out, I didn't have professional references. I just had personal references. 
but I still talk to them about what they would say and how they would say it. And as time went on, I, I've gotten more professional references and, and former supervisors, which is always great to do, and if you can lead to that, that's great. However, um, I still get in contact with those people anytime that I'm on the job uh, seeking front. So it, it's very important that you do that, because if you let those contacts go that are really good references, um, and all of a sudden a job calls and says, hey, I'm calling for a reference, they can go, uh, what? And then you've just lost credibility. Yeah, yeah, you lose credibility, but that does also does something else for you when you're maintaining those relationships that helps you to build your network. And if they know that you're actively searching for a position, they may have uh, some somewhere they can direct you that might be hiring or might be looking for someone. So it's kind of a, a double whammy when it comes to maintaining those relationships. Great point. Good point. So awesome. So that pretty much covers all the questions that we have online. Thanks a lot, everybody. That was some good, good, good questions. So I hope um, that was very helpful for everybody. Um, so I think that's going to uh, conclude our presentation for today. We really appreciate you joining us. And again, um, our contact information is listed here. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact us um, at 1-800-955-2527, extension 173. Um, and then again, to promote uh, and let you know about the Career Launch Program, it's really a great comprehensive program. So if you're looking to learn about how to construct a, a, a well-written resume, conduct uh, great interviews, uh, job search strategies, and even more um, branding, uh, salary negotiation, all kinds of great things. We definitely invite you to take part in that program. So feel free to call us and we can give you more information. But that concludes our webinar for today. And Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Every day.